Hello everyone and welcome to the second lecture in our DeFi MOOC. My name is Dan Bonnet and I'm a professor at Stanford University and in this lecture we're going to talk about an introduction to blockchain technology. Before we get started I want to uh, quickly reiterate something that we talked about in the previous lecture which is basically what are blockchains for. So abstractly a blockchain provides a way for multiple parties to coordinate when there is no single trusted party. Yeah they basically use the blockchain to perform all their co coordination activities and they don't need to rely on any single trusted party. One thing that I'd like you to remember is in any environment where there does exist a party that everyone trusts, typically there is no need for a blockchain. You can basically rely on that trusted party to carry out all the synchronization operations. Yeah, so blockchains are primarily used, useful in situations where there is not just a single party that everybody trusts. And of course, that's very common in the financial system where there is nobody that, 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 that we trust. In the financial system, everybody's kind of out looking uh, for themselves. And as a result, it's better to design systems that don't assume that there is one particular trusted party. Okay. So let's talk about what a blockchain is. And in my mind, a blockchain is sort of made up of four uh, separate layers. Okay, maybe I'll call them levels instead of layers, but um, uh, there are basically four components to them. Okay, so the bottom layer is what's called the consensus layer, and this is what's used for the parties to uh, coordinate and agree on the current state of the chain. Yeah, we'll talk about this in just uh, in more detail in just a minute. The next layer is what we call the compute layer. This is basically once you've established um, a base layer of consensus, now it turns out you can define abstract computations on top of this layer. And yeah, this is what sometimes is called, is called a blockchain computer. I kind of like this term. Uh, so we'll talk about applications that run on, on top of a blockchain computer. And it turns out that in fact, often these two layers are sort of merged together. And um, people sometimes think of uh, like the core blockchain as both a consensus layer and the compute layer together, but I like to keep those two uh, concepts separate. The third layer is basically now that we have uh, uh, something, a computer on which we can run applications, the third layer is basically the applications themselves. These are sometimes called, called uh, decentralized applications, dApps, sometimes they're called smart contracts, but these are basically the applications that we run on the blockchain. And finally, the fourth layer uh, consists of user-facing tools, which is basically how the public actually interacts with these programs. Okay, so we're going to talk about each one of these four layers in turn. Let's start with the consensus layer. So consensus actually is not the topic of this course. So I'm going to go through this very, very fast. And basically, we're just going to assume that a consensus mechanism exists, and then we're going to put it to use. Okay, and so what does consensus actually buys us? Well, if you think about it at a core uh, core level, a con consensus really is about building uh, a new capability that we didn't actually have before, which is what's called an append-only data structure. Okay, so it's basically a data structure that anyone can write to, but once something is written to it, that information can never be removed. Yeah, so let's just summarize that more carefully. So there are sort of four properties that we talk about when we talk about consensus. The first one is what's called persistence which is once you write something onto the blockchain, it can never be removed. Yeah, this is a property provided by the consensus layer. And by the way, the reason there's a star at the, uh, at the end of that sentence is that there's a caveat to that, which is assuming the adversary doesn't control more than half of our network. Yeah, so there's no 51% uh, attack. If, there's, if the adversary controls a minority of the network, then uh, persistence is guaranteed. And the way we achieve persistence is by replication. Yeah, we replicate data all over the world across many, many, many different machines. And as long as the adversary doesn't control more than half of those machines, it can never remove uh, data that has been written to the chain. Okay, the second property is actually what's called consensus, uh, which says that basically all the participants, all the honest participants in the network actually agree on the same data. Okay, so they all have consensus, meaning they all agree on what's on the chain. It's not the case that one party thinks one thing is on the chain and another party thinks something else is on the chain. And the reason I have a double star on that, on that at the end of that sentence is because this is true but perhaps it's not quite true for the most recently added blocks. Yeah, so maybe for the, the last uh, five or six blocks maybe are still stabilizing and we don't quite have consensus for those, but all blocks that came earlier, there should be consensus and all the honest participants should agree what they are. 
Finally, there's a very important property called liveness, which means that the, the chain doesn't get stuck, which means that the honest participants can always add new transactions. They can always write new data to the blockchain. Yeah, it doesn't actually get stuck. And finally, the fourth property is uh, what we call openness, which says that in fact, anyone can add data. It's not just registered and authorized participants that can write data. And some chains actually are open, like the Bitcoin and Ethereum networks are open. Anyone can write uh, data, anyone can mine and create blocks. Uh, some other networks are not as open. And in fact, there's a whole spectrum uh, of, of openness. So that's why, um, as I say, some chains actually are open and some are not. Okay, so that's, I think, uh, at a high level, what I want to say about the properties of a consensus. Let's quickly take a look at how blocks are added to the blockchain. Um, so this will kind of uh, uh, illustrate how the consensus mechanism uh, works in practice. Okay, so we have our set of participants here. Let's call them Alice, Bob, and Carol. Okay, and so each one of them has a secret key that they're going to be using to sign transactions. Yeah, we'll see how digital signatures work later on in the lecture. But for now, just think of these as secret keys that are used to authorize transactions. Now, uh, Alice, Bob, and Carol, they each create a transaction uh, on their own. They sign it using their secret key, and they send their transactions to the network, to the blockchain network, which is basically just a collection of miners. Okay, so they have like a, an address of a, of a few miners. They send um, those transactions to those miners, and then there's a gossip uh, protocol that replicates, that propagates all these transactions uh, throughout the network. Then um, there's a, um, a leader election mechanism where some of the mine, one of the miners gets elected. Uh, in this case, you know, the top guy got elected and he's the one who's gonna be creating the next block. So what he does is he takes the current uh, pending transactions. Sometimes this is called the transactions in the mempool. Yeah, the current pending transactions. He creates a block out of them. Namely, he kind of puts them together and uh, does some more things to them that we'll see in just a minute. And then he posts this block onto the blockchain. And now because he was the leader and he did the work to create the block, he's actually rewarded and he's getting what's called the block reward. On Ethereum, this would be, for example, uh, two Ethers that are given to the miner for creating the block. So you can imagine everybody wants to be elected as the leader because every time they're elected as a the leader, they actually get to be uh, get paid. Yeah, so there's some competition about that. Uh, and one of the issues with building consensus is how do we make sure that the leader election mechanism cannot be subverted? But now we have one block on our chain um, and all the other miners look at that block and they verify that that block is valid. If the block turns out to be invalid, it's simply discarded and it's as, it's, as if it's never, it was never posted to the chain. The next thing that happens is now we move to the next block. So now our friends, Alice, Bob, and Carol, again, have new, a new set of transactions that they want uh, to post to the chain. These transactions basically indicate, you know, who's paying who, or maybe some more uh, complicated data that needs to be posted onto the chain. Um, they, again, they sign these transactions, they send them to the network, they send them to the miner, and a new leader gets elected. In this case, the second guy got elected. Uh, again, he gets to form the block, he posts the block on the blockchain, and he gets his two ETH reward. Okay, and this process continues again and again and again, and that's how the blockchain evolves. All right, so I think this is all I want to say about consensus in this course. Consensus, of course, is a very big topic, uh, but it's actually not a topic of our uh, DeFi course. So I will just leave it at that. Um, and let's move on to the next layer. So the next layer I want to talk about is the compute layer, what we call the blockchain computer, which allows us to run applications on top of a consensus layer. Okay, so the idea here is that once we have consensus, we have a way to write information so that it can never be removed, we can use that to actually implement a program, right? So the program basically moves from one state to another, to another, to another, and all those state transitions are written to the blockchain, and everyone can verify that those state transitions are valid, right? So uh, again, programs basically are uh, manipulating states, and uh, all those uh, manipulations of state are written to the blockchain, and everyone can verify that they're valid. Okay, so again, the DAP logic, the program logic is encoded in some program that runs on the blockchain. What that means is that the rules are enforced basically by the public program, right? So anyone can inspect the program that's running on the chain. This is why this uh, area, by the way, is such a wonderful area to work in. Um, all the code that's running on the blockchain is completely public for the whole world to see. Yeah, so there's no proprietary code, no secret code. The code that runs on the blockchain is completely public. Everyone can verify that uh, it's a, it does what it's supposed to do. 
So in that sense, we have uh, transparency in that we are guaranteed that these programs actually do what they're supposed to do. We can look at their code and verify that it's correct. Uh, and then uh, the, the, that program itself is executing is executed um, basically by whoever's writing new blocks to the chain. Yeah, every time a new block gets written, uh, that block might contain um, in a, a few instructions that were executed from uh, uh, by this DAP program. Okay, so that's how programs execute uh, on the blockchain. The interesting thing about that is we actually have what's called public verifiability, where anyone can look at the chain and verify that actually the program is executing correctly. So the source code for the program is public. And in fact, the um, all the state transitions, all the execution of the program are is public as well. So everyone can verify that the program is correct and that it's being executed correctly. So this is kind of the beauty of running uh, programs on the blockchain. You, ha you don't have to trust anyone to run your program correctly. You can just look at the data that was posted to the chain and make sure that the program is running correctly. By the way, we'll see what these programs do in just a minute, but uh, basically that's kind of what this compute layer does. And in fact, there are lots and lots of programs that have already been written to the blockchain. Um, you know, here we have some examples like MakerDAO and other others that we'll see in just a minute. Um, these are, you know, programs that are several hundred lines long. They capture various business logic, yeah? And, and uh, they react to uh, commands from the public, right? So people can issue transactions to these, uh, send messages rather to these applications. Uh, and these messages cause these applications to, you know, process and maybe send funds from one person to another. That's a state transition, but all of those transitions are recorded on the blockchain and anyone can verify that they're uh, actually correct. Okay, so uh, that's kind of the third layer, which consists of the actual applications running on top of the blockchain computer. So in this course, you'll be running, writing some of these applications yourself so that you'll see exactly uh, you know, how they operate and how they execute on the blockchain. It's very interesting because it's actually a new way of writing programs. Um, and as you'll see, it requires new languages and it's actually quite different from traditional programming. So it's really kind of fun to learn how to write these applications. And then finally, the fourth layer is uh, the layer that interacts with end users, right? So we can see you have our consensus layer here on the bottom. We have the blockchain computer on which the programs are executing. Yeah, so um, this blockchain computer typically is what's called a virtual machine uh, emulator. So it's running a virtual machine. These dApps themselves are programs that run on top of the virtual machine. And then the public, basically here we have our end user. He's in, the public is interacting with various uh, cloud servers that um, then themselves interact with these uh, programs running on chain. Yeah, so the third, so the last layer, the fourth layer is basically the layer that actually takes commands from the users and actually reads and writes data to the blockchain. Okay, very good. So those are the layers. And uh, I wanna kind of stress that this ecosystem is an extremely active ecosystem. Yeah, this is just one graph that uh, shows all the, uh, the DeFi projects out there. This is way out of debt at this point. There are many, many more DeFi projects out there. But nevertheless, I wanna call out a few of the main ones that I'm really excited about. Um, so for example, Compound is a lending protocol. It's very, very interesting in how it does its lending. We're gonna talk about Compound at length uh, during the course, but that's an example of a program that's running on top of the blockchain computer. In this case, it's running on top of the Ethereum blockchain computer. Another one is Uniswap, which is basically an exchange. It allows you to exchange one type of currency for another type of currency. Again, this is a program that's running on top of the blockchain computer, and um, anyone can interact with it and use it to exchange one asset for another. Yeah, so that's another example of a of a um, of a DAP. And by the way, the way you interact with it is you interact with the Uniswap uh, cloud servers which then interact with, um, with the DAP itself, or you can choose to interact with the DAP directly from your laptop if you want to. So it's sort of up to you how you actually interact with the application itself, either directly or through some cloud service provider. Uh, another thing I want to call out are, is a whole bunch of custodial services that emerged. So custodial services basically help you protect your assets uh, when they're stored on the chain. You want to make sure that your key, the key that authorizes transactions, you want to make sure that key is safe and secure. And these custodial services will, will help you basically secure the key. Yeah. So again, very interesting area of how to build custodial services. And finally, I'll call out um, MakerDAO and their DAI currency, which is a stable coin 
coin. We'll talk about stable coins again at length during the course, um, which is a way to, uh, which is basically a program that tries to build a currency that's stable, even though it's built on top of an unstable infrastructure. Stable in the sense that its value doesn't change dramatically from day to day, even though the underlying assets like Bitcoin and Ethereum or other assets might actually fluctuate uh, quite wildly. Dai is meant to um, to be to be a stable currency that does not fluctuate as much. Yeah, and again, we'll talk about how this works later in the course. So the interesting thing is there are lots and lots of experiments happening in the space, lots and lots of DeFi projects that are are running and managing billions of dollars in assets. It's really Quite remarkable to see these programs actually manage um, a huge amount of, 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 of funds. Um, and so obviously it's really important that these programs don't have bugs in them and that the public trusts them. So again, this is why it's so important that the code for these programs is public so anyone can inspect it and that their execution is public so anyone can make sure that these programs are running the way they're supposed to be running. Yeah, so all this is uh, happening uh, all around us quite successfully. And it's an uh, ever-growing space, which is, again, exactly what this course is about. Okay, so let's get started. So this was just my quick introduction. Uh, the next segment is going to be, we're going to dive right in, and the next segment is going to be about uh, crypto cryptographic background, basically the cryptographic primitives that are needed to understand how a blockchain works. Okay, so we'll see you in just a minute.